Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Wacom webinar. We're here with Sir Wade today, and we're going to learn how to build a successful art channel on YouTube. But we're going to hang out here for just a few moments, let the room fill a little bit. Sir Wade, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great as well. I'm loving your setup. It's looking awesome. Thank you. If uh, if chat wants to control the lighting, you know, drop some colors and hey, that'd be we can awesome. Mix it up. Drop your favorite color in the chat. Sir Wade's going to switch up the setup for you guys. Let me make sure I have the chat open. Pink. Let's try that. Do I have pink? Let's do pink. I have Very pink. Nice. There what you go, guys. Purple, <laughs> blue. Oh my gosh, these are going fast. Here, you read them to me and I'll try show. to hit the buttons. <laughs> Light show and webinar. <laughs> it's Disney's world of color. That's what's happening here. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Looks like we have a good group of people here. So again, this is a webinar on how to build a successful art channel on YouTube with the one and only Sir Wade. My name's Shireen Feridnia. I'll be the moderator for today's chat. We also have Tom behind the scenes pulling all the Zoom levers and Elizabeth over on Facebook. We are also streaming to Facebook today. This will be about a one hour session. We will leave the last 10 minutes for Q&A, but I will also be asking Sir Wade questions throughout the chat. So please use the Q&A feature only, not the chat or the hand raising, just the Q&A. And due to time constraints, only some of the questions may be answered, but we'll do our best to get to all of them. And this session is also recorded. We will be sending a YouTube link to this session to all the attendees afterward. And we have a promotion here today that you can check out. I will also be displaying this slide at the very end. And without further ado, Sir Wade, I'll let you take over the screen. All righty. Oh, please. No, no, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> Stop it. What's up, everybody? <laughs> um, I have sound effects. I hope you don't mind. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to steal the screen share. Like so. Snatched. All right. And I'm also going to make sure I keep the chat and the, or the Q&A open. So what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm excited to get started. I have a few things I want to show you, but I guess the first thing I should do is tell you who I am and why you're listening to me. Uh, my name is Sir Wade. My first name is actually Sir. I get that question a lot. It's not just a thing I do for YouTube. Sir is my first name. Wade's a middle name. I stick them together. So Sir Wade. That's the deal. Um, I'm an animator, a visual effects artist, and a full-time content creator, which you can read. Um, I used to work at DreamWorks. I was there in 2016 to 2018. I'll talk a little bit about that, but that was kind of always my goal. My dream goal, like job, was animation. I want to be an animator at a studio, work on movies. And uh, when I was at DreamWorks, I was a training. I was a. We'll talk about it, but. I wasn't an animator, but my career took a little bit of a shift, and I want to show you a little bit about that, how that went, things like that. And um, I just recently got this. I didn't hang it up yet, but I figured it kind of led some credibility. But hooray, this showed up recently. So hopefully I know somewhat what I'm talking about. We'll see. I'll let you be the judge of that. So let's get into it. I have a video trailer to show you, which I'm going to pull from off screen because better frame rate that way. So here's a little bit about some of the stuff I do. So there's some fun stuff. Oh, music back on. All right. So uh, that's some of the stuff I work on. Let's talk a little bit about it. So today I want to talk to you about a few things, actually a lot of stuff. I'm going to try and get through a bunch of stuff. I want to get to Q&A hopefully as quick as possible because I want to answer all the questions that you guys probably have. I'm sure that 
all of you out there have lots of questions because I, sir, I sure did and always still do. So we'll talk about a little bit my career path, uh, my YouTube timeline when I left DreamWorks and how that went. Uh, we'll talk about viral videos because I know that's the thing people always wonder about. We're going to talk about making money on YouTube because that's a big question that no one ever seems to talk about. And I'm going to tell you all the dirty details. So well, not all the details, but you know, enough that hopefully it goes well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about gear, software, my workflow, some tips, dealing with growth, uh, some branding lessons for you out there, and some information that if I were to start today, what I would do. So hopefully that'll help any of you out there actually take this and move forward and actually do something with it. So let's do it. So uh, here are some thumbnails from my YouTube channel. I do a whole bunch of stuff, but the most important things when I talk about my YouTube channel are usually these four questions. Like, what am I doing? Who is it for? How often do I upload? And what am I making? And that's a big thing when you are starting your channel is you want to make sure you have an answer to these things or at least you're trying to find the answers. Um, so for me, my channel is for artists who are interested in animation. It's all about the animation industry. The original purpose of my channel was, it, it, the, the series that I began with was how to become an animator. My journey of becoming an animator, because like I mentioned, that was the goal. And still is, but there's a lot more to it now. And we'll get to that. My channel is mostly for students, aspiring and professional artists. It's anyone who is interested in animation with a focus on learning in a entertaining way. Edutainment, I guess. Um, I have been posting for once a week for about two years, and I've recently upped it to two a week. I also just recently moved, so currently that's not working out so great, but normally two videos a week. And the content's a big mix between, you know, educational stuff, just trying new things, and sharing the tips and tricks and stuff that I've found useful for myself that I would, just in case anyone else would like to know. Uh, when I worked at DreamWorks, I was in the education department, which not a lot of people know the studios have, but a lot of studios have a department dedicated to whenever someone gets hired at the studio, they need to go through some training. Day one at DreamWorks, if you would have been hired there, your, your first thing, your first person you would see is probably HR, but after that, it's most likely me or one of the people on the team that I worked on. Um, you'd be very excited to know that you'd be taking a Gmail class, a Gmail and Google Calendar class, basically. It's a very exciting class. It actually was. Um, there's a lot more to Gmail than you think, but that was one of the not as much fun classes I taught, but I taught over 50 classes. My job was a technical training specialist, which just means I am an artist software trainer. I taught software. I taught tools. I had to learn everything about all the tools that I was using or that we were using in production so that I could show new features to veterans or get someone new up to speed on a tool that we only had at DreamWorks, something proprietary, things like that. And I also got really, really good at explaining complicated things to people who weren't usually used to thinking that way. So um, that was a lot of fun, which led to, it really lent itself to the YouTube channel. So it kind of became a strength. So when I first started the channel, um, it came from a place of, well, I spent a lot of time with interns, probably because of the similar ages, but I spent a lot of time with interns and I'd always talk to them and like, oh, like what's going on? What schools are you from? And what do you guys want to do? And I'd see what they were working on at school and what they were looking, working on their, in their free time. And something really big that I realized is that the schools weren't teaching them the stuff that they really wanted to know. And they didn't really know where to look for a lot of it. And so I took a lot of time on my own to develop some classes and things at the studio to show them cool stuff that they weren't getting at school, which kind of became the inspiration for a lot of what I did on YouTube. When I started learning to anim when I started learning animation, I had wished that there was an online resource somewhere I could go to start learning stuff. And at the time there wasn't, this isn't that long ago. This is 2014, 2015, like four or five years ago, four or five, six years ago. I can do math, I swear. Um, there really wasn't anywhere to learn animation for free. And I thought at the time, like I should build that. I should be the first one to do it. And I didn't, I was afraid of trying to like make a name and try to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna document my process of becoming an animator. I was afraid I would not get hired. I like, what if I got fired? Like what if something bad happened and then everyone knew cause I put it on YouTube. I didn't want that. So I didn't start the channel. Four or five years later, I'm working at DreamWorks and doing all this cool stuff. And I realized, wow, this would have been a really cool story to share with people. Man, I kind of screwed that up. I guess I should just start. And it's actually my, Girlfriend at the time, then my fiance, now my wife, who, who inspired me to start my channel. She's also a full-time YouTuber. So we're both full-time YouTubers. So that's kind of fun. Um, and I learned a lot from her. So these are some of the first videos I made. And I just made whatever I could. Anything that I felt 
somewhat qualified to talk about, which is mostly my experience. Any questions I was confident enough about to answer and a few tips I had on things that I was decent at. For example, I've done parkour for many years. So filming animation reference, if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's just a lot of animators will record clips of themselves doing a certain action to inform the performance when they're doing it in the computer. Like, oh, like when you do a running jump, what side, like left or right, do your hips twist left or do they twist right? Things like that, mechanics of the body, that's stuff that when you're learning or just in general, sometimes you want a video to help you kind of learn what's going on. So that was a video on getting tips for that. Things like that. Eventually I left and uh, I left because I wanted to travel. I wanted to try freelance. I wanted to try YouTube. I felt that if I got the dream job, if I got the animation job at DreamWorks, I'd never want to leave. And so before I had kids before, because we don't have kids right now, before I had kids, before we had anything like tying us down, I wanted to try the risky stuff before it was too late. So, you know, just trying to try lots of things, exciting times. So I have a small video for you, something short. And if you watch my videos, you may have seen this piece, but this is some clips from my last day at DreamWorks. I thought it'd be kind of fun to show, share it with you. Today is my final day at DreamWorks Animation. I used to live here. That's DreamWorks. It's in Glendale, Southern California. I'm going to talk over a little bit if you don't mind. The last time I parked here. So this was the walk I made every morning. It was kind of cool. My last day at DreamWorks was the same day of the TV release of a new season of the Trolls TV show. So my last day at DreamWorks was a big party. Uh, free food at DreamWorks. I don't know if anyone knows that, but they give you free food. These are a bunch of friends, animators. I'm JP Sands. I'm a second I'm a supervising animator here at DreamWorks. JP and I filmed an interview. He was super great. There's a great video on my channel if you've seen it. <laughs> Busy, so busy. So this is it. I'm on my way to return my key, my badge. After the day, I'll be a mere mortal. <sighs> it's becoming real. It's hard to leave a place like this. I was also very nervous about the decision. Now I'm going to meet my first friend that I met here at DreamWorks. We both started on the same day, and we've been friends ever since. It's been over two years now. Ah, you scared me. <laughs> Okay, so I just got locked out of my account, which means that my, my time here is over. I was trying to do emails and stuff and my account went away. And that's good. The rest is just me saying like, I'm late, I gotta go, bye. But more time for Q&A if I end it a little bit early. So let's keep going. So I left DreamWorks. At the time, these are the videos I had made up until that point. I didn't leave DreamWorks because my YouTube channel had blown up and I was gonna make all this money and like it, I didn't leave for that. I just left because I really wanted to give it my all and really try for that. I had been learning so much of my job and I got to a point where I was like, I think I'm ready for the next step. And I wanted the next step to be YouTube instead of animation at the studio at that moment. And I still want to animate, but it, it became a different set of goals. So these are some of my early videos and I want to talk to you about one of them in particular. I don't know if any of you have seen this video. I, uh, I recognize a few names in the chat, which is super cool. Hi everybody. And, uh, Many people found my YouTube channel from this one video because it went viral. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because that's a big thing that a lot of people are kind of hoping for when they make YouTube. I'm going to go viral and it's going to be great and I'm going to make all this money. And where do we get the Photoshop pillow? I got that from Adobe actually in college. I did a tour. Um, so I want to talk about this video. This video kind of put my channel on the map completely by accident. I actually don't like this video very much. I made it because it was one of my best ideas. And I was like, I'm going to make this video. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And uh, I didn't do a very good job. of uh, Most of my early videos, they were uh, pretty terrible. They, you, you'd look at them and you'd just say, I don't want that. And I'd agree with you. And so I want to show you what happened behind the scenes. In YouTube does everything in months. Every, everything that YouTube will show you on the back end, the analytics, it will try to show you everything in the, in the period of 28 days. For whatever reason, that's just how it does it. So this was in 2017, September of 2017, almost three years ago exactly. It was September 19th. And 
the first month this video got a thousand views. And I think my channel had about maybe 1500 subscribers at the time, somewhere around there. So I had a decent start. I'd been making videos for about six months. Um, the channel was about six months old, 1500 subscribers, which is pretty solid. Um, and this was the first month. And I have, I have kind of hidden here the estimated revenue. How much do you want to guess I made from this first video? Let's drop those guesses in chat. By the way, if, let me just remind everybody that if you have questions, throw them in the Q&A block. Um, not in the, in the chat, but if you have a guess here, I'm seeing a dollar, 10 cents. Not, not very high number guesses. You'd be right. I got a dollar, 33 cents. Cha-ching. <laughs> uh, after three months, the video started to pick up. It started to get about 6.6 .6 thousand views. It got a lot of views. It got over 6,000 views in three months, which for my channel was huge. That was like, oh my gosh, this video is doing incredible. Like I've never had a video do this well. Most of my other videos had maybe 1,500 views at the most after building up for close to a year at this point. And this video got me 100 subscribers in that three months. And uh, anyone want to take a guess at how much I made from 6,000 views on this video? It's also not just about views. I'll talk about that in a minute, but if you have any guesses, it's gotta be more than a dollar, right? I got 12 bucks. <laughs> so not bad, better, definitely better. And uh, after six months, the video blew up. If you look at the graph, you can kind of see that somewhere in the early February, it exploded from nothing to just having a ton of views and then it kind of tapered off. And that's how things work on YouTube. YouTube, nothing goes, well, most things don't just go viral and stay viral, they go viral and then they, they pass, they kind of die off. And they don't usually die back to where they were before, but you can use that momentum to grow. Now, after six months and 700,000 views, close to a million views, I gained 10,000 subscribers. And anyone want to take a guess at how much I got from this video at this point? So this is, remember, this is the, this is the one month window from early February to early March. More or less, this period of time is uh, how much I got for a viral video. I got 500 bucks. Not too shabby. Now, after three years, this is today, this is uh, as of last night, this video has gotten 2.7 million views. It's gained me almost 40,000 subscribers just by itself. And that's just people clicking on the subscribe button on this video, not necessarily going to my page and then subscribing. So this may, number may not be exactly right, which is why you get the little warning symbol. Anybody wanna guess what a video with 2.7 million views has earned me on YouTube in the past three years? See some guesses. <laughs> I'm seeing 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 2,200. Somewhere around the one to three range, one bazillion dollars, I wish. This video is about $2,000, which is pretty solid. Most people look like, wow, $2,000 for a video. You have to also consider that's over the course of three years with $500 initial blow up in the first month that it, or actually you know, six months in, but first month. That is uh, roughly $30 a month give or take. Uh, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. I get to see this pop up every month. This video still does about $30 a month. And you have to think about this. That's pretty good, right? Like that's not bad. That's the highest performing video on my entire channel. That is the most money I've ever made from a video. No other video has come close to that because no other video has 2.7 million views. So this is my top end at the moment. Now there are some ways where this number could be higher. Um, there are also ways this number could have been lower financially. There's a lot of factors. It's not just about views. We'll talk about it in a minute, but I wanted to show kind of how this works. Let's talk about the, the, the analytics, the scary stuff. It's really not that bad. Um, I'm also going to answer some of these questions really quick. How many, how many years of savings did you have before you decided to leave DreamWorks? Not that much, honestly. Um, I pretty much, I spent the majority of the money I had left from DreamWorks. I got my kind of final payout. I actually bought a laptop for editing because I had a desktop computer and my plan was to travel and I wasn't going to be able to edit on the go on a desktop computer. So I actually didn't really have anything saved up. But my wife and I, we had recently gotten married. We decided to move in with my parents actually as kind of a home base while we traveled. So we lived in their downstairs of their house in another state. We packed all our stuff, put it in storage, lived in my parents' house and used the money that we would have spent on rent to do other things, to invest in the business, to travel, to get content, create content. That was kind of the goal there. Um, Sir Wade, I can ask you some of these questions. That's great. Let's do that. I just realized there's a button that I'm not hitting. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No, I was like, I can take over this part. We Thank actually you. have a couple questions coming in now. Um, 
Marisa wants to know, when you were a small YouTuber, were there times that you weren't growing at all? And if so, how did you push through the times you felt discouraged? Absolutely. There's times like three months ago I wasn't growing. I was stuck. I think the actually probably, I didn't grow a lot right at the beginning for the first probably nine months or so until that viral video. I hadn't grown, I had kind of grown to 1500 and then stopped around that point. And I also recently, I stopped around 70,000. I hit 50,000 subscribers last summer and I didn't get past like the 70, I didn't grow past 70,000 for almost a year. I only recently blew past that and shot up to what, 120 now. But um, so it happens no matter what size channel you are, you will hit these, these roadblocks every now and then. And some of the biggest thing, I have a few tips in here for, for how to get through that. But one of the biggest things is you have to remember why you're doing this because if you have a real creative purpose or a reason, if you're helping people, if you're creatively fulfilled and satisfied, if you're using it as a way to learn new stuff, if you have a kind of another reason why you're doing it aside from the growth and the money, which you should, then you focus on that. There are definitely times where I've gotten stuck kind of on the wrong things and I get frustrated. I'm like, oh, I'm not doing well. My videos kind of suck right now. Like it could be better in this way. It could be better in that way. I'm not making any money. I'm not growing. No one's seeing the view, like the views are down. Like that happens and it's rough. But ultimately, none of that was the reason I started the channel. And it actually was the reason that I was being held back as I was focusing so much on those things, trying to make the videos that people, I was chasing views. This happens to a lot of YouTubers. You start chasing the views, you start making the stuff that you think people want to see, and then they don't come and watch it. And you're like, what the heck's going on? It's because people can see that you're not happy making this stuff. You have to be really passionate and excited about what you're making because then other people get excited about it with you. And so when I started changing up what I was doing and I started trying new things and I started making other videos, I started wanting to learn new softwares and new tools. And a lot of people who might know my stuff in, the, in here probably found me from those recent videos um, trying new software. And that kind of brought in a new audience because I was excited again. Awesome. You want to go through a couple more questions before we go into analytics? Yeah, let's do a few more. Okay. Emily says, do you feel running a YouTube channel for art is just as satisfying or fulfilling as contracting or being employed for a studio? I do. Now, to be fair, I haven't worked as an animator at a studio. That was my goal, and I have yet to actually do that. Uh, but I've done animation freelance, and I worked at a studio in a different different department, right? So I've, I've kind of done some of it. And it's actually really fun. Like, it's it's challenging in a different way. Like, you have to, you have to enjoy the pain of, like, when you work for yourself and you do a YouTube channel, like, a lot of people are like, wow, like, I'm going to make videos all the time, and it's going to be so much fun, and... I just get to do whatever I want and work on my own hours and blah, blah, blah. And like, that's kind of true. But also that when I, I spoke at a career day at, of like a middle school or something or a high school and one of the kids asked me like, what are your hours? Like, do you work, like you do your own hours? I'm like, yeah, I work from 11 to three. And they go, wow, 11 to three. And I go, yeah, 11 a.m. to 3 a.m. And they all go, oh. And that's 100% true. I start my day a little bit later because I'm a night person, but I work every day. Like I was up until like 5.30 a.m. last night and not just because I had a presentation today and I was like procrastinating or something, but like I'm usually up super late. And my wife's a morning person and she is also up pretty late or at least up pretty late for her and then up super early. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding and challenging and fun in a way where you're kind of blending the creative stuff that you like doing and the business stuff that you have to learn and absorb and all the other skills it takes to put it all together and you try to build something that no one's done before and make it into something that you can actually eat every month. <laughs> awesome. Okay, we'll go through one more question. This is from Stefania. Hopefully I'm not pronouncing your name wrong. Um, they say, hi, I would like to know what is a good way to start doing videos and what do you think about doing them without showing yourself, just your art and your voice? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. A few years ago, I might have doubted it. I might have been like, well, it's not very common. That's a great idea. If you are not comfortable on camera, so I'll, I'll get to the first part of your question in a second, but if you're not comfortable on camera, you don't have to be on camera. There are some YouTube channels that are incredible. The production quality is amazing. There are others that the production quality is terrible. Absolute terrible production quality on purpose, or at least because they don't want to deal with that the thing that makes the YouTube channel interesting is the lens that you tell the story through. And that always makes it sound really intimidating for someone like, it's all about story. You have to tell a story. 
I always found that really kind of hard to grasp of like, what story am I telling? I'm just trying to make a video here. But the big thing is you want to make what you want, what you want to make what you make, but you want to find a creative way to tell it. Some of my first videos are literally me sitting on a couch with no fancy bells, or, like literally just sitting on a couch talking to the camera for 30 minutes. That sounds awful, I bet, and I think it is. But those videos have a ton of views and people found my channel from those originally. That's all I had for a long time and that's how I grew 2,000 followers initially and that's the main videos that drove my channel for a very long time. People still find me through those and I'm so sorry to those people, but it's boring. But people care about the content, not necessarily the presentation. If you can either have really interesting content or a really interesting presentation of the content, those are kind of two ways you can play it. There's a lot of ways to do like, have your art be your avatar. You can use like Adobe Character Animator is a, is a software that if you have the Adobe Suite, which I have links to at the end, um, you can actually puppet a character of your own design or a default design or whatever. You can puppet it with your webcam and it'll lip sync it with your audio. Like there's all kinds of crazy tools. Or if you just don't want to have any person in it, you just have the content and you voice over it or you just do it silent. You just have like a top down shot of you drawing time lapse with nice music or something. Create an environment that works for you and fits your creative voice, and there is an audience for it. You just have to find them, and you have to make the stuff so that they can find you. Very nice. All right, we'll let you continue with analytics. All righty. Back into the fold. Analytics. What it means and what actually is important. Um, when I log into my YouTube backend, I can see a lot of data. And I didn't include all of it in this presentation because you'd all fall asleep and we'd run out of time. There's a lot of data. One of the things that I can see is a, is a graph like this. This is from my channel. This is over the last couple of months. Now, what you can see is a time graph, right? June through in September. And if you look at the beginning, there's four videos in very close success. And that was the twice a week, right? I was posting a lot. And then I stopped posting for like a month because I moved and I didn't have stuff kind of pre-prepared like I should have, like I wanted to. And I've only posted like three videos in the last month or two. And it's actually a very, it bothers me very much because it's actually a big problem for me. On the business end, terrible mistake, but there wasn't a huge way to avoid it for the way I did things. Now you can see when I was posting four videos up here, the, the numbers, everything was higher, things are lower, we get the gist. The things that I care about when I look at this are not the views necessarily. Um, it's the impressions click-through rate. So what that means is when it says impressions, that's how many people are seeing my content, my thumbnails, my posts, like on YouTube, like whatever it is, that's how many people are seeing my stuff. 31 million people. That's a huge number. Um, this 2.8% means that 2.8% are clicking on my stuff, which because I haven't been posting, most people are just seeing my older content. They may have already seen it. It may not be the right fit for them. That's a terrible number. Um, because I haven't been, normally that number is like five or 6%, which is great, but right now it's not. Now, what that means is 31.4 million people are seeing my stuff. YouTube's recommending me to a bunch of people, 2.8% click through rate. That means that I'm getting about 887,000 views from those 31 million people, which that's a, kind of a sad number. That's not nearly as good as I'd like it to be because I'm not posting. And people are watching for this time period on average six minutes or so which is also lower than usual. Um, but that's how long people are sticking around and then I get my watch time metric. So these, this little graph doesn't look like a whole lot and it doesn't seem that important, but it actually contains the three most important things about your YouTube channel from, the, from, from YouTube's point of view. YouTube's goal is to have creators make stuff and put it on the platform and to have viewers watch it. That's their goal. They make their money from advertisers giving YouTube money giving them a cut and saying, hey, we want to put an ad on some YouTube videos. We'll give you a bunch of money and put our ad on some videos, right? Like that's the deal. And YouTube says, cool, yeah. We wanna make sure that we put these ads on videos that are doing very well so more and more people see these ads and we can make more money. It's a business, makes sense. So fun fact, when you turn on ad block, it's actually the create, it's YouTube YouTube's not getting hurt from it. It's actually the creators who you are not seeing the ads on their videos and therefore they're not making AdSense on the on those videos. So it actually hurts the creators to have AdSense, to have, have ad block on. Just as a fun fact in case you didn't know that. Um, but I won't judge you today. Uh, but the thing is, YouTube wants to make sure that the content on the platform is clickable 
people are interested in watching it. So it gets the views. It has a good click through rate because people click it. So the views go higher. And then the watch time is extremely important. If you click a video and in the first 10 seconds, you're like, nah, and you click something else, that video and that channel get penalized because you clearly didn't like that video enough to stick around that YouTube takes note of that and says, okay, that content's not very good. Give them a hit, try something else. And so it kind of has this crazy like backend ranking. This is the algorithm that everyone always talks about. Oh, the YouTube algorithm. That's how it works. It's a business and it makes sense. And the whole point is to make sure your video is clickable enough to draw in viewers, but delivers on that promise. And is not just bad clickbait because you actually have to engage the viewer, make them want to stay and stay for as long as possible because it'll help the audience connect with your channel. It'll also help YouTube give you a little bit more credit and show you to more people. And so therefore these numbers all go up. As far as people finding your videos, there's many ways to do it. In my specific case, a lot of my content is educational. It's based around an industry that there's not a whole lot of information for on the internet, animation, um, at least detailed information. And so a lot of my search traffic, you can see on the left, comes from Google search. People are like, how do I do this thing? And they find my video. So my external traffic is very heavily skewed towards Google, which is nice because YouTube and Google, same company, so they kind of like that. Um, on the platform itself, I have this little pie chart and it shows you what's what. Browse features so basically just means someone's on the home page and my video pops up, which is great. So that means YouTube is recognizing my content as valuable and showing it to more people. You will not see this with such a high number when you're first starting out because YouTube doesn't yet know if your content is worthy of their home page, right? And everybody's home page is different based on their viewing behavior and stuff. Suggested videos is on the side. The more content you make, that's all kind of consistent. That's why you want to, you, YouTube will tell you that you shouldn't make like, I'm going to make a painting video and then I'm going to make a tech review and then I'm going to make a video about chairs and then I'm going to make like a, I don't know, a cooking video. Like if you just kind of make whatever, YouTube doesn't know how to categorize you. And so it doesn't know how to link your videos together and serve you to a similar audience. It's just like, I don't know what you make, but if you make one type of content or at least one genre or one kind of, you can mix it up, definitely mix it up if you want to, but having some consistency within your channel will help you to serve you to the right places better and suggest you in relevant feeds. It's kind of how this works. That's, an, that's all of YouTube's goal, just to kind of give you the people who are gonna watch your stuff. Once people watch your stuff, they click on it, they show up, you get this kind of information. How long are they watching? Watch time wise, that's kind of a very abstract number. It doesn't mean a whole lot to us. It does mean a lot for your financial side, but what you care about is the average view duration. What is the average that people stick around and watch your videos? Because if your average view duration is like two minutes for a 15 minute video, it's not great. It means people aren't really sticking around. That viral video I talked about earlier, that video was like a 15, 20 minute video and the average view duration is and has always been about two and a half minutes. Meaning people only watch like, what, 12, 20%, something very, I don't know math, but something very small, right? Very small amount. And that's part of the reason that video didn't make more money. It made fine money, but it didn't make amazing money. And that's a big reason. The video wasn't good enough to keep them for long enough to generate more ads, more ad sense, and so on. But it was long enough that they stuck around for a bit so that YouTube wanted to recommend it to more people and it got the viral boost. So it's kind of, kind of both. You can also see the retention in YouTube. I can actually see a graph to see when people drop off. So I can see most videos have this type of a curve. Everybody clicks the video or an auto plays or whatever. So you always start at hundred percent and then very quickly people either who are on autoplay are like, Oh, I didn't mean to go to the next video and they, they leave or they click something else or they exit the page or whatever. So you always have a certain amount of drop off right at the beginning. Now your goal is to keep this line as high as possible by making your video engaging, fun to watch, interesting, and uh, long intros, long outros, a lot of talking without a lot of substance. If like, there's a lot of my older videos where I just kind of talk and I repeat myself and it's just very fluffy and I, have, I just get to the point kind of thing. And you just see this graph just drop. Um, but you can see here that most videos have this kind of curve. You will lose people over time. People are busy, they have lives. Maybe they love your video, but they're gonna come back later. Doesn't matter. Sometimes you'll see spikes, which is interesting. You can see this video, starts at 100% and then it actually has a spike that's above 100%. If you can see the graph on the right, it goes up to 120. The spike here is actually higher than the initial thing, which means people are either going back and rewatching that section, causing that part to build up like a callus, 
kind of a gross way to put it, or it means that people are rewatching the video. Or in another way, it means that, you know, it's starting here and dropping off and going back up means people are skipping that section. People are showing up, they're seeing me talk, they're saying boring, and they're skipping ahead to this point and it starts there. And then they go, do I want to stick around? And a lot of people say no, <laughs> and it drops down. But a lot of people say yes, and it stays pretty high for a while. And it goes to about six minutes and 20 seconds. That's good. Most view durations are about two to three minutes on YouTube on average, I want to say. And so if you can get above like three minutes, that's pretty good. If you can get people to watch for three minutes, attention spans, that's a success. Anything higher, it becomes kind of a bragging point if you're ever going to like work with a company or something like, oh, well, you only have... We'll, we'll talk about brand deals in a little bit, but like when you work with a company and sometimes they're like, oh, well, you don't have the most views. And you say, yes, but my engagement is very high. That just means, yeah, but my community actually really likes what I make. Those who stick around and watch, they watch. They stick around, they watch, they comment, they share, they thumbs up, they come to my other platforms, blah, blah, blah. It makes it a lot more compelling than, yeah, I could get a million views or 2.7 million views that stick around for two minutes or I can get 100,000 views and they stick around for nine. Which one's more useful to you? the one where they stick around for longer usually. So it's just a very interesting, there's a lot of stuff to it. Now. Sir Wade, do you mind if I interrupt really quick with a question? Now's the perfect time. Okay, awesome. We have a question from Facebook actually that I thought was interesting. What happens when you know you have a unique brand, you follow what your insights are telling you to do, you're putting all your effort into making the right content and nothing moves. How do you figure out the algorithm? You very rarely figure out the algorithm, but there are some things you can do to help. Um, there's a lot of factors and without knowing your channel and without seeing it and being able to kind of give you a guess of like, oh, like I might be this because it's so different for every channel. A few common things that it could be. Um, it could be your title, could be your thumbnails. If people aren't compelled to click by what they see there, it doesn't matter how good your video is, how amazing the content, how entertaining you are, how much work you put into editing. If people aren't clicking the video, they're not going to see any of it. That is usually the first and most important thing to get right. And if your channel is not succeeding, it's probably a good place to look to see if it's going wrong. So feedback is helpful. Um, and study your own viewing behavior. If you are making a certain type of content, chances are you're probably watching stuff that's kind of in the same ballpark, at least in some ways. So look at your YouTube history, look at all the thumbnails, screenshot them all, put them all in Photoshop, just stack them on a board, print them out, do whatever you gotta do and just kind of analyze and say, what do they have in common? What do they do differently? Which ones catch your eye? Which ones are maybe not as strong that you didn't notice this whole 30 minutes that you've been staring at this board? You go, oh, I didn't even notice that one was in here. That's gonna be a big thing of like, okay, well, the ones I like all use the color yellow or they all do this thing or they have really bold text. And you look at yours and say, ah, yeah, I can barely read that or whatever. Another thing actually that I do, let me see if I can show you this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna improv for a second here. Something that I do when I'm creating thumbnails and titles, if I can do this quick enough to make it worth it, is when I am creating a video, often I forget to do the thumbnail until the end, which is bad. You should do the thumbnail either early on or make a plan for it or never skip out on the thumbnail. The thumbnail should take three to five times longer than you, than you would normally spend on it. If you're gonna spend like 10 minutes taking a picture, edit that picture for like an hour or like create, it's, it's spend a lot more time than you think on those kinds of things because they are the most important thing to people actually watching your video. But something I can show you is when I'm creating a thumbnail, I will sometimes screenshot, I'll search for the type of video that I think my video is gonna be. Like I recently did a YouTube studio tour and I showed my office and the tech I use and all that kind of stuff. And I searched like YouTube tour or whatever I searched and I found the YouTube page and I actually searched a few different things, screenshotted all of them, combined the best thumbnails, search results into one Photoshop file. And then I put it in Photoshop. I brought my thumbnail in and the text that I was thinking of putting for my title for my title. And I, I stuck it in there and it said, how does mine stack up on the page compared to everybody else's? And I'm trying to pull it up for you, but my, picture viewers being very slow. So I'm going to try a different app really quick, but I saved it just in case I needed it for something like this in the future. And look at that. Another pro tip, save all your stuff for future. Can I open it in this app? Yeah, yeah there we go. So this is not the best app to view. I don't know if I can zoom in. Oh, I can. So I made a studio tour and I put a few of my favorite creators in here. I searched office tour. 
this has got 2.2 million views, 1.1 million. This is a channel I really like. My friend Chris is in here. Um, and I stuck mine right here in the middle and I tried to just, I wasn't trying to copy anybody. I had a lot of similar ideas and you can see where I got some inspiration, but actually it looks like a blend between these two, which is kind of funny, but my goal here was to make sure that when you look at this page, mine actually stands out. So do that with yours and it will really show you where your thumbnails are lacking. I think that's my answer to that one. <laughs> awesome. We have another question that actually I think it's going to lead it right into your next slide. Valentina wants to know, what do you do to make money while you're waiting for your video to generate a decent amount of earnings? That's a fantastic question. That's exactly what we're going to talk about next. Let me show you how I make money online. <laughs> YouTube has what's called AdSense, which hopefully by now I've kind of given the gist. It's when people are watching your stuff and they see an ad, you get a cut of that ad revenue that was paid to YouTube, you get, I think YouTube takes like a 45% cut. I don't know the details, but there's a whole thing of how you make the money, but it's not a lot. Now, if you have a channel, like Casey and I said, if you have a channel that's like millions of subscribers and every video is getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views, maybe millions of views, then yeah, you're making a lot of money. And I'll talk about how much that could potentially be without knowing all the exact details in a second. This is my pie chart. I thought I'd show it to you guys. This is my pie chart of the money I have made this year so far. So this is 2020 um, up until now or everything that I've got signed in writing. Um, these are my earnings for the year. YouTube is 10% of my total earnings because I diversify. That is probably the best thing you can do if you're trying to make money online because here's a few different reasons why. Number one, you don't make all that much from ads. Like you can make decent money, but especially at the beginning, you just don't. And even if you started a channel today, you're not even eligible to, to enable monetization on your channel until you hit the certain threshold. But it's not a ton and it's not reliable because you never know what it's gonna be every month. Another thing is, what happens if YouTube changes tomorrow? YouTube could change their algorithm. Alg algorithm. They could change the platform. Something could happen at Google where they're like, oh yeah, we had, a, we had a, some creature that came in and laid eggs in the server room and it ate the computers. I don't know, just whatever. But something could happen to YouTube and then we lose YouTube. And then if that was where you had all your eggs in that basket, then well, you have no eggs. So diversification is very important and one of the best things you can do. Also, you can see that YouTube's not even my biggest chunk of the pie, not even close. Um, brand deals, which is working with companies, is the biggest part and often is for a lot of people. Patreon, a huge thank you to anybody, any of my patrons who might be here um, who support what I make. That's, a, that's the next biggest section. When I teach workshops, um, Twitch, live streaming platform, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Affiliate links is a very easy one you can do. Affiliate links, which for me is only 2%, it used to be a lot bigger. I haven't been making a lot of stuff that fits in here, but affiliate links are one of the easiest ways you can make money right out the gate. Because what it is, here's an example. Amazon has a free affiliate program. If you shop at Amazon and you know some cool stuff and you recommend to your friends like, oh, you should totally buy this thing, it's on Amazon for like whatever price, you can actually create an affiliate account for free. And as long as you have a couple people buy from your links in the first however long they let you keep the account and you keep going um but it's free to start and what happens is if for example if i said hey this vertical mouse is fantastic i love it i don't know if you guys can see it but like hey this vertical mouse look how cool i do like it and people have asked me what mouse do you use and i say i use this one and i provide a link to it in the description that is generated from the affiliate website it does not change the price of this mouse if you were to buy this right now from my link it would just take you straight to the page on Amazon, you can put it in your cart and buy it. Nothing is different for you, but Amazon gives me a small commission for referring you to it, for causing you to buy through their service. And if you have lots of people buying a few little things every now and then, when I did a tablet review video pretty early on, I think I had about 20,000 subscribers and the video did decently well, decently well, I forget. I was making about four or $500 a month from just Amazon affiliate because people were buying the tablet. And I wasn't trying to sell the tablet. I was just sharing like, oh, here's some tablets. I got sent these from a company. Here's what I think of them. Here's the link in case you want to know. It's actually cheaper on Amazon than it is on their website. So I shared the Amazon link and people were buying them. And it was super cool. And I don't make a lot of tablet reviews, but I did something similar with, you know, I do that kind of stuff every now and then. And I should honestly, if I wanted that part to go bigger, I should do it more often, but it's not the content I'm 
I've been super passionate about in the past. I love tech, but I haven't had really, doesn't matter. I'm going to be doing more product review stuff because I enjoy doing it. I just haven't been making the videos about it. But um, anyway, that's, that's affiliate links and that's a really easy one to get started with. I think that answers the question of how to, that's, that's kind of what you can do in the meantime when you're waiting for YouTube to be bigger is you make other sections of your business and try to treat it like a business and grow different opportunities to help boost your income because chances are YouTube's not gonna be enough on its own. It sure wouldn't have been for me. Do we have any more questions that I should hit now? We have lots of questions. We have a variety too. I'm gonna kind of jump to a different topic here. Miko says, do you get scared of having an audience? When I started painting live, it was just me. But now when I see 200 people in the chat, it feels a bit intimidating. Any way to get used to being seen? Well, I feel like it just, it does get easier with time, but it, depending on your personality, it may never be like the most comfortable thing. By the way, congrats, 200 viewers in a stream. That's a great amount. Good work. Um, your stuff must be good. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer for that one. It's, it's something that you get better at with practice or more comfortable or more used to. Um, and for a lot of people, that's intimidating, but it is, if you want to make it a part of your business, then it becomes something that's just part of your job and you just have to do it. But there are ways you can get creative with it and maybe you know, sidestep some of the stuff you don't like as much. Like if you are, um, if you don't mind having your voice in it, but you don't really like being on camera, maybe change the angle so your face isn't in it or do something interesting where you do have like a, a, a character you've created drawn as your, your avatar on screen or something. Like there are ways to kind of go around it a little bit, but if you are, but here's something that's important is that depending on what you're doing, like, for example, if you were trying to be like a gaming creator where you are playing games on Twitch, you can watch anybody play games. There's a lot of people playing this stuff. They don't come for the game. They come for you. They come for the personality. And that's mostly true on other platforms like YouTube. Sometimes you, it is your art that they come for, but you're the one making the art. And depending on how much, like, if you are just doing the art and your stuff isn't growing, you probably need to add a little bit of yourself in there to make it interesting because... Anybody could be doing the art, but it's your art, so be there. Or if your stuff's doing really well and you're already a part of it, be cautious how much you remove yourself without having a, a backup option because chances are you're probably a big part of why it's doing so well. I don't know if that's helpful at all. <laughs> that's great. Um, I'm looking at your graph here and brand deals is a big chunk of it. We actually have a couple people asking for you to talk a little bit more about how you secure brand deals. A question that I have had lots of questions about myself over the years. Um, yes. By the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, just in case, if you are asking questions and we don't get to your question right away, I am going to be live on Twitch right after this. And I think we'll talk about that at the end. But like, if you have more questions and they don't get answered, just know that you will have another chance if you want to hang out longer. But anyway, um, how to secure brand deals. There's not like a right way, but the most important things, <clears throat> there's a lot to talk about. Some of the most important things with brand deals are your content has to be good and ready for brands to want to work with you. That's probably the most important thing is like, I wanted to work with a lot of companies right up front. Like when I first started the YouTube channel, I was like, wow, I wonder if I can be sent free things or get paid to make videos about these things. Like it's totally, it's not bad to want that stuff. Like it, it's like, you see it and you're like, that'd be super cool. Yeah, it would. But you also have to make sure that as a business, it makes sense for those companies to want to work with you at all. Like what's in it for them? If you're making really cool stuff, they may just want to be a part of it. Like, oh, well, you're using our stuff to make cool things. Like, that's awesome. We love when people use our things. And that's a good way to do a partnership. Sometimes you grow such a big following that they want to get in front of your audience. That's enough. Like, there's a lot of different angles that it can take. The best ones are where there's that natural fit, where you are already interested in something and you're using it regularly and you are a part of that ecosystem and a part of that community and your content evolves it in some way. And then you're making cool stuff and that company takes notice and then you find a way to organically connect. That's the best case scenario. As opposed to, there is another way to do brand deals, which is, hey, will you sponsor me? Hey, will you sponsor me? And not that you're asking everybody, but like there's a lot of channels that you've probably seen just in life that they just do an ad read for any normal company. And that's not a bad thing either. That's a business move and it's not a bad decision. And most, most channels will say no to stuff that doesn't make sense for them at least successful channels will do that. And that's a big thing is saying no. I get plenty of emails from companies that 
I don't really want to work with because it's stuff that I don't use or I don't think I would want to use or it's, it just isn't a fit for me and it would be disingenuous. It would be a lie for me to say, yes, give me your money audience. This is a, you know. Enjoy this product. It's fantastic. I use it every day, except not really, but I'm being paid to say this. Your audience will know. They will see right through that and you will not grow because nobody wants to follow someone who's that fake. So use the stuff and build cool things. And when you're ready, companies will reach out to you. You can try reaching out to them. There's nothing wrong with a very polite and professional, like share some content, tag them in it, do that every now and then eventually be like, Hey, like I'm making this stuff. I have this idea. I'd love if you would, if you want to get involved, here's some ideas. Like you can totally enter those kinds of conversations. Social media is awesome and you can use it for that kind of stuff. Um, but just be very nice about it and don't do it right up front because if you don't have anything to offer, you're just going to kind of give a bad first impression. I have I one more question for you and then we'll let you continue with your presentation. All right. Peter wants to know, what did you, I'm sorry, why did you start streaming on Twitch and not YouTube? That's a good question. The reason I actually started live streaming is not even because I wanted to add another platform or anything. I was not doing enough creative work. I was spending a lot of time making videos, but I wasn't doing anything else. And I had a lot of freelance projects at the time and I had a lot of stuff I was working on, but I had a hard time focusing. I'd sit at my desk and I'd scroll and I'd get bored or I'd get, I'd, I'd just get dis distracted. And I actually started streaming as a, in a desire to have no excuse to not work. That was actually the reason I started streaming was if I ever have one, like if I'm sitting at my computer, I'm supposed to be working and I'm, on, and I'm live streaming. If somebody happens to pop in and I'm on my phone, that's not good. It's not a good look. So I have to stay focused. So I actually started streaming as a way to force myself to work. And if somebody came in, I'd love to talk about what I'm doing, share some tips, or at least like maybe someone, I've had a lot of times where I'm working on something new, trying something in a new software. And I don't know what I'm doing in that software exactly, like the stuff I'm super comfortable in. And the chat actually helps me. People show up and like, oh, I'm really good at this tool. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm working on this thing. I'm really struggling. Like, oh, I've been doing it for 15 years. What do you need? I'm like, how do I make this work? Oh, that button right there. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so much easier. So live streaming actually was a way to be more productive, but it's continued because I just love hanging out with that community. And the reason I chose Twitch over YouTube was two reasons. Number one, I think the Twitch experience, the culture of Twitch is more fun. It feels like a live stream platform. You show up, the whole experience is around live. There's emotes and all this fun stuff. You can gamify it in all these interesting ways. For YouTube, it just felt like, well, that's why I go to watch my videos and live streams just kind of on there. It didn't feel, I don't know, like YouTube comments. We all know how people feel about YouTube comments. I didn't want that environment. I wanted like the Twitch chat because that has a more fun energy to it. And so that's kind of part of the reason I chose it. But that doesn't mean I'm like super, super loyal. Like I'm a Twitch partner. I make decent money. It's 7% on my income. It's, it's super, and that's all from like the support of my community. That's not, I mean, ads on Twitch are like pennies. So that's all my audience and that's all my community. And I'm super grateful for it. But, um, you know, if something happened to Twitch or YouTube set out did all these amazing things, I would consider switching, but I like to keep things in different baskets, kind of the diversification thing. If something happens to Twitch, if something happens to YouTube, I have the other one. If I put everything in one, it's a little bit more risky. Even though my viewership would be higher on YouTube, I like the vibe on Twitch better for me personally. Awesome. We'll let you continue with your presentation. We'll get to some more questions soon. Alrighty. So, gear and tech. Uh, I'm going to show you guys a quick little snippet. I don't know if you've seen my video. If you've seen the recent video, then you may have already seen this intro clip, but I apologize. I'm going to show it to you anyway, because it took me a whole day to make this and I'm kind of proud of it. So where is my VLC player? There's that video. That's not what I want. I want this one. <laughs>
So that's a little tech video, by the way. So I saw someone in the chat ask something about my uh, sound mixer and thought it was a stream deck. It's actually this device. This is the device that I'm running all my audio through that gives me the voices and uh, it's a lot of fun. I also can do this. So uh, that's called the Go XLR. I have a link to it in my video. You can buy it through my affiliate link on this video. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about gear and tech. Obviously my setup, well, if you've watched my stuff for a long time, you know it's upgraded. If this is your first time you're seeing it, it can be a little like, holy crap, that's, uh, that's a lot of dollars. Yes, it did not start out this way. My first video was actually a camera that I got from a relative. And if I didn't have, if I wouldn't have had that one, I would have used my phone. Phones are better than most cameras at this point. Um, so you can use literally anything, you can use a phone. What I would recommend is camera, microphone, lighting. Those are the three things, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. I have some tips for you on actually making some stuff. But when I first started, I didn't have any of this gear. I didn't have a microphone. My fourth, I think my fourth video I ever posted, I got a comment from somebody I knew personally. I knew this person, and they still gave me the comment that was like, dude, your audio is shit. Get a microphone. And I was like, wow, that hurts. But uh, he was right. And I listened to it and I listened to other videos on YouTube and I realized, wow, my audio is echoey and you can, it's bad. And uh, so yeah, I, I bought a microphone. I bought this, I got this microphone, which is off camera. You can't really see it. It's not plugged in right now. I use it for my YouTube videos, but currently I'm obviously using a different microphone, which is also newer. Anyway, it upgrades over time. We'll talk more about it. I'll leave room for questions for that, but you don't need a bunch of fancy stuff. You just need like whatever you have. There's a lot of free stuff. There's your phone, which you have. Your phone has a great microphone. You can use somebody else's phone if you need, or the hundred dollar microphone will do just fine. Audio recorder, external audio. Um, lights are $15 if you get a cheap one. And then there's plenty of free software out there. There's DaVinci Resolve, free video editor. There's um, HitFilm. Oh, there's a free visual effects software. I use Adobe for most of my stuff, which is not free, but there's a student discount as well. Anyways, moving on for now. Production workflow. This is a, uh, a new tracking software I've been testing out. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. I use it to keep track of things. So this is my process, right? Record, sync, edit, thumbnail, publish. I have an editor now. She's great. And so I sync files and they end up on her computer. That's what the sync box is for. But I want to talk about a few of these things. Planning your videos goes a long way. I didn't used to plan videos. I used to just go in and wing it. I'm like, I know my stuff. I know what I'm talking about. Let's just figure it out. I don't like scripts and I continue to not like scripts, but I do like to write bullet point outlines these days because recording always takes longer than you think. I, in general, would... I'd probably, on average, I would almost always film a video for about four and a half hours. I'd film for four to five hours every time I want to film a video. Sometimes I'd film it multiple times because it didn't go well the first time or it was hard to edit or I didn't really like the way it came out. And uh, I'd have to edit that four hour video down to about 15, 20 minutes. And that was still for a longer video. That was rough. And I did that for years. I mean, I, there's a lot of wasted footage and a lot of wasted time that could have been spent on other things. If I had just planned out the videos, I could have split it into multiple. I could have just found the best parts. It takes a long time. Editing is where you can make it really interesting. If you are not a particularly interesting public speaker, I wasn't. If you watch my first videos, please don't. But if you did, I look like a hostage. I, I literally look like I'm being held captive. I sit there, I'm like, Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Become an Animator. I'm Sir Wade. In today's video, I'm going to be talking to you about something that's going to bore your head off because I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to talk for half an hour. And the whole time, I'm just going to talk about this monotone. I might get louder, but that's about it. That was the video for half an hour. Boring as heck. Editing is where you can make things interesting. And if you don't want to be on camera, that's where you can throw a bunch of other stuff over your voiceover and you can put all the cool stuff. Editing is, it's helpful. The thumbnail is not to be ignored. I talked a little bit about this. Don't neglect it. Plan it. Plan your thumbnail when you plan your video. Try to think of good options. Come up with different versions. I very, It's very common that I do two, three, four, five different versions of my thumbnail. Put it in the feed. Try it on my phone. See how it looks when it's small. And then make a decision. And uh, publishing can also be somewhat involved. If you have, for example, a lot of product links, like my studio tour video, I actually spend about four hours 
hunting down every product, every book, every statue in my office, everything that I have that I showed in the video, I wanted to include it in case somebody would have found it useful to find it and just have a link to it. Obviously also to help with the affiliate stuff, but I spent hours getting that description text ready to stick it in the box and then we'll do the rest of the stuff. So a few tips and tricks, just some different things I've learned that I wanted to share with you. By the way, I know we're technically at time, but I was told I can go over and I'm, I intend to. <laughs> yes, go ahead. If everybody else is good and everyone wants to hear more, let us know in the chat. Sir Wade, if you're feeling good, please keep going. Sweet. What do you think? Should I keep going? Do we like it? All right, we're going to keep going. It looks like everyone wants us to keep going. Let's do it. All right. Uh, tips and tricks. Simple stuff. Your camera is not your most important thing. Most people think it is. They think a, a big fancy camera is going to do it for them. You can have a $50 webcam and some nice lighting look better than a $5,000 camera with bad lighting. It won't matter. Your camera cannot save bad lighting if it's bad enough. And most of the time it is. Like, this is pretty cool. Let me take a second. I'm going to actually turn off the screen share for just a second. And I'm going to show you my office. Cool lighting. But let me show you what it looks like normally. Give me a second. I'm going to turn these off. So first of all, we've lost, so we've lost a lot of interesting things. I'm going to turn off my main lights. This is actually how dark it is in my room. Generally, I have the windows not blocked out. Let me show you my regular lights. This is what my office would normally look like if I just filmed with regular lighting, which I used to. Now, what you might notice is that I've got dark circles under my eyes because I've got top-down lighting and it's casting shadows from my brow, which isn't the most appealing. It's harder to connect with anybody. Um, my background is lit really nicely, but I'm not, so I'm no longer the focus. Um, and it's just not really well directed. So, turn everything off, close all the windows, see what you can work with and introduce lights one at a time. So if I introduce, for example, my lights. I'm gonna turn the left one on, and it gives me kind of this dramatic light over here versus the right light. This is my key light. This is my main primary light that lights it from the camera's perspective. Um, that's my face, more or less evenly. This gives it a little bit more direction, makes it feel like maybe there's a window, my monitor, whatever it is, feels more directed. And for a long time, I mean, most people just do something like this. If you also have Ah, we're going improv. I didn't plan this, by the way. I have one more light here. This would be your three-point lighting setup. This is your rim light. Maybe something like that. I don't know. Something to separate you from the background. You can see that without it and with it, it just kind of separates me from the background even more, which becomes very interesting when you have fancy colors. Those are like 30 bucks on Amazon. Link on the video, but literally they're cheap, they're easy. And uh, if I had a color, this is a, another like $100 light. Oops, that's the party mode, I don't want that. Give me just a second. HSI, there you are. There. Great, while you set that up, Peter wants to know, should I also have music playing in the background? For your videos, I would recommend it. Unless it doesn't fit your content, it's a great idea, it helps fill the empty space, especially if you're a little bit more awkward like I am, um, or at least especially how I was. Uh, music can help set the tone for a video. If you are talking about something emotional, I'm not saying you need to have the saddest piano song ever, but it can help set the mood and help your audience connect with what you're trying to tell them. It also just gives it a more high, produ high production value. Um, it makes it feel a lot more professional to have music if you can. I do have links a little bit later in the video of where I get my music. They are again, affiliate links because that's how I share my stuff. But um, yeah, I have, I have a few links to where I get my music. So I don't have to worry about copyright. YouTube also does have a free copyright library that you can use their music without worries, but I like the custom stuff. Camera lights are cool. The most important thing is the microphone, straight up. If you don't have the microphone, you guys have been listening to me this whole time through this fancy microphone and with all the sounds and the, the music, I'm actually gonna switch for a second to just see if I can change it. Do I have another microphone plugged in? Here, my, my VR headset. 
Where is that? I don't think. No, I don't think I have it. I don't plugged in. It, it's showing up in Zoom, but I don't actually have it plugged in. So, never mind. I don't have another microphone to show you. I was going to show you a bad microphone, but I don't have one. Anyways, microphone is actually way more important. You cannot watch a video if you can't listen to it. It'll it'll drive you crazy compared to visuals that are subpar. Color, super cool, super fun. We've got some in here, but music is actually more important to the experience, I think. And it goes with your question. And editing can make all of that useless because you can edit something without music, without color, without anything fancy. And as long as the audio is not gonna drive you crazy, the editing can sell it. It can tell any story. So you can use these as different tools. You can use all of them, totally up to you. When it comes to the back end of YouTube, Tags are important. Tags are your way to basically hashtags, you know, same type of thing. You can tag a video with different search terms that you want people to search and pop up your video. But the title is more important than that. And the thumbnail is the most important. People, the thumbnail has to catch their attention. And then they look at the title. And the tags is kind of what helps them find this search result in the first place. But if they're not going to click it, they're not going to watch it. So this is very important. So let's talk a little bit about growth. As you are growing, as you are starting, or as, as you're trying to grow, some different things that I have learned or heard or found that I've found useful along the way. If anyone knows Gary Vee, Gary Vaynerchuk, this is from him. Document, don't create. This is especially helpful for artists. All of us who like to make stuff, it takes a long time to make stuff. Most of us know this. And uh, if, you, if you do stuff that doesn't take you that long, you have an advantage because you can work faster than a lot of people. Animation takes forever. And uh, the most important thing as a YouTube creator is to make as many videos as you can that are good, that you're proud, proud of and happy with. And you can do that a lot more efficient, effectively and efficiently if you are documenting your process instead of waiting until you have the final thing to share. Because it could be months until you're done. But if you document your process along the way, your audience gets interested and wants to see you succeed, wants to help be a part of that journey and wants to see the progress, wants to learn from you, wants to be able to absorb that information or at least just finds it interesting. And so, I mean, that's why behind the scenes documentaries are so popular. Like there's so much with documenting your process and not just relying on that one final product that could take forever. That's a, that's a big thing with creating content. As you start to grow, don't fall into the trap of just trying to make everything to please other people. If you have to, one for them, one for you. Make something that they want to see and they're asking for and you think will get you the views, and then make something you're going to be happy with. You need to give yourself that power. Don't give your audience all the power. Don't let them choose every video for you. Don't let your viewers dictate where you go because it is your life and you're going to get creatively burned out if you don't have stuff that you're excited about built into your work. Speak your truth. This is a big one. Just, you know, everyone's going to do things differently. There's a million different videos and channels and like there's tons of stuff out there, but no one's going to do what you do the way you do it. And that's what makes it interesting. Anybody can do an animation tutorial, a drawing video, a painting guide, whatever, but no one's going to do the way you're going to do it. So find a way that is interesting to you, the way you learn, the way that you think would be the most fun to do it, share it that way and try to make it fun to watch the way that you'd want to watch it make stuff that you'd be interested in seeing and most importantly remember why you started because as you grow there's a lot of stuff that comes into it but you will never be as happy doing this and as successful doing this unless you are doing the stuff for the right reasons the stuff that you got excited about in the first place otherwise you you get off that center and you do just get burnt out things stop working you stop growing and you just get frustrated and it just spirals now, a little bit on branding, because I feel like that's something, I get a lot of questions about this. Um, just as a side thing, don't call people viewers. Don't call them your audience. Don't think about them as your followers. They're your community. Try to build a community, not the rest of the stuff. You're not trying to build a brand so that you can get followers and have an audience and people viewing your stuff. Like you're trying to build a community, depending on what you're trying to do. Like in my case, like I'm trying to make stuff that helps people. I'm trying to make stuff that's interesting and fun to watch and interesting or, and um, entertaining and educational. And I want people to get excited about all that type of stuff and like learning together. That's my community. And uh, really keep yourself from thinking about it in terms of like the influencer and the community like, or, and the followers. Like that's gross. Nobody likes that. 
But if you are a creator and you're building stuff and you're building a community, that's fun. That's exciting. And people like to be a part of that. And that will keep you centered well, again. So some questions I get a lot, um, for example, Instagram or YouTube or whatever. Do you put personal videos and stuff or do you just stick to portfolio pieces? If you're trying to make this a business, depending on the way you set it up, like vloggers can do both, but it's also very kind of variety based. But in art channel cases, usually with our kind of stuff, it's a good idea to split it. Maybe not always, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I think it's a good idea. Like you wanna have pictures of like you and your cousins and you and your friends and your, your, your pets, like, you know, do that. But then maybe have a channel, maybe have an area just dedicated to your work. If it's, if it's, especially if it's going to help you get hired. That way recruiters don't have to filter through other stuff. But there's also the, the idea of you versus, like you, you as a person versus you as a brand, kind of dipping into the second thing, your screen name versus your name. Like, do you brand yourself some other name you come up with for your channel or as your personal yourself, right? That's kind of the same question in a different way. In my case, I've actually done it differently. I am branded as Sir Wayne Iset, my name. I'm self, like I'm, my, I'm a personal brand as an artist and I'm tied to everything I do. Also, I only have one Instagram account, which includes my personal life and my professional stuff. I don't post all that often, I should do it more, but I do blend the two together, but I am very thoughtful about what I post and I don't just post anything. I try to post stuff that fits both. Um, and so there's, there's always an exception, there's always a way to do both, but people do connect with a person more than they connect with a logo. So if you have some organization that you've created or some name that you think is gonna be really cool, that's totally fine. But make sure that you are the face of it. Whatever you are creating, that the focus is on the personality behind the content and not some logo, because then it's just not interesting. You can treat it like a hobby, you can have fun with it, but you also have to know that it is a business. If you're trying to make this your living, if you're trying to make a, like if, if you are trying to just have fun with it, then just have fun with it. But if you do want it to be your business, you need to treat it like a business. You have to show up to work every day, you've got to put in the work. You can have fun doing it and you should have fun doing it. But you do have to remember that it is a job and there are parts that you may not like as much and you have to do them anyway. Or do them for so long enough that do them for long enough that you can hire someone else to do them. <laughs> um, a few other things about branding. As you're building the community, reply to every comment. Instagram, YouTube, whatever. Reply to everybody. They're all there. They've given you time. They're being a part of your community. Give them some time. Respect their time like they're respecting yours. Um, ask your audience for feedback. Ask the community. I, a lot of my first videos came from requests because I wasn't sure what people wanted to see. I wasn't sure what I should make. Where do I start? So I just asked. People told me. I made those videos. Didn't make all of them. And there's plenty I made that they didn't ask for, but those are some of my favorite ones. Uh, listen to the constructive feedback, but mute anything that's not constructive. I have a lot of words blocked on my YouTube. You can block words so that when they get commented, they get filtered out. They don't get to show up under the video. Um, there's obviously like for Twitch and stuff, there's mods. You can have people manually do this, but you can actually automate a lot of that process and YouTube's pretty good at it. Spam, links, harassment, anything that happens like your best. And here's the other thing, do not give them attention. If you've got trolls, if you've got haters, if you've got people being rude on any social media platform, it is not worth your time and mental health trying to reply, trying to convince them, trying to share your perspective. If it's something constructive and they're trying to bring to your attention something that you're not super comfortable with, this may be a little bit different, but if it's something that's just straight up mean, your best thing to do, don't even reply. Go to their little comment thing, hit the little three dots and say, hide user from channel. They will never show up on your comments again. I have done this for hundreds of people who are just mean. They're just unkind to me, to other people, to other members of the chat. I'm very, even at the, I mean, I don't read and reply to every single comment every day anymore, but I read them all. I might be a couple of days off, but I read them all. I check every couple of days to make sure I didn't miss anything crazy. And sometimes there's great requests in there. And sometimes there's just people who I'm like, nope, you, you're not, nope, you're not going to be here. And I hide them from channel. They can watch my videos, but they can't make it an unpleasant place for anybody else. So make sure that if you've got weeds in the grass, you just pull the weeds out. You don't try to make a little corral for them because they'll just overgrow and you'll lose track. Pull them out. Finally do the work. 
that's probably the most important thing when it comes to the branding and the business part, especially if you're like, I want to get brand deals. You have to have something worth sponsoring before a company's going to want to give you money to sponsor something. And that's something that even today, like I struggle with. I'm like, oh, I want to work with this company. And then I think about it, I'm like, well, why would they want to work with me? I guess I should make more of that type of content that they'd be interested in before I ask, because I don't want to, I don't want to be there. Please. Hang on, my music stopped. Now it's quiet. So quiet. There we go. The mood. <laughs> <laughs> it's back. We got it back. <laughs> um, I have a few slides. Actually, I have only a few slides left. Um, where to start? A lot of people ask, like, where should I begin? Like, what should I make my channel about? Find the stuff that blends perfectly between what you're really passionate about, you're interested in. Maybe you've got some skill and you have something you can do with it, or at least you're going to start the skill and start learning. You don't have to be amazing at it. You don't have to be the best. Just talk about how you do what you do. And you got to be creative. You find that little happy medium, that's you right there in the middle. Happy, having a great time. So where to actually start? Start with your worst video, the worst one. It's always the worst one. I, I waited on my channel for three years. I was like, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel at some point when I'm ready, when it's gonna be good. I'm gonna wait until I've got the camera, I'm gonna wait until this, I'm gonna wait until that. Waste of time. Because the amount that I grew from when I said I'm gonna start to when I actually started and I thought I was ready, I was I mean, that video was terrible. Like I said earlier, it's, it's garbage. But I grew so much better, so much more quickly by doing it all the time and getting better and improving than if I had waited at ever. Like, always just start and start with your worst video. You can always hide it later. You can always take it down. It doesn't matter. You control the comments. You can, you can turn off comments if you're worried about it and you, you know that's going to kind of hurt. Turn off the comments, just post some videos, get practice, or just make them and show them to friends. Don't even put them on the internet. Just make stuff, make your worst video first, and just keep making several bad ones after that. You will continue making videos, you will continue getting better, and you'll keep getting more proud of yourself for making stuff, even if it's bad. You'll just be excited you're doing it. Like, wow, I've been doing it. This is great. This feels good. You'll look back and realize, whoo, I've come a long way. And that means that you're improving. Start with your best ideas. Don't hold on to these amazing ideas until like, oh, I'm going to wait until I'm I'm up here and then I'm gonna make that video because then it'll be worthy. Make the good stuff. That was my viral video. And I'm not saying that's gonna happen for everybody. I'm shocked that it ever happened to my channel in the first place. But my, I, I wanted to make that video so bad. I was like, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait. And I just said, like, no, you know what, I'll just, I'll just make it. How many people are really gonna see it anyway? Well, joke's on me, it got 3 million views. But you know, I still don't really like that video, but I have never really had the time to make a follow-up. I always wanted to make a whole series off it. I never really got around to it. Well, it's a good thing I made the first one because uh, it was one of my best ideas and the internet liked it. Everyone in my community also thought it was a good idea and it helped grow my channel into what it is. Imagine if I had held on to that one. May never, may never have grown the way I did. But start with the right reasons. Don't do this to get rich, to get famous. It's, it's probably not going to happen like that. I've been doing this for three years, which is not the most amount of time. And I've grown pretty fast, honestly. But obviously, like I'm... I'm not, I mean, I'll just tell you, I'm not rich. I'm not. <laughs> and I'm not famous. And I don't have any of those things that like a lot of people are like, I'm going to start YouTube. I'm going to have all these things. Like, no, <laughs> but I have a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. It's very rewarding and it's super creative and it's super interesting. And if I ever want, if I ever find it's like too risky and it's like a bad idea and I need to go back and do something else, like everything else is still there. If I ever wanted to go get another job, nothing's stopping me, you know, like, that's another thing that people are always worried. Like, what if I, what, what if like this or what if that is like almost everything else is still there. This is just, this is something that people always go through those waves of like, oh man, I should have gotten on TikTok in the first week. I should have been the first person on Snapchat, blah, blah, blah. Start now. I remember in 2012, I wanted to be a streamer. I wanted to be a streamer. I wanted to play games and uh, I convinced myself by a lot of, I had a lot of friends who told me it's not going to happen for you. It's a pipe dream. What are you doing? It's a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately I listened and I was like, you're right. I'm never going to make partner. I'm never going to be a Twitch. Like I'm never going to make money on Twitch. Like it is a waste of time. And I didn't do it. Well, until I started streaming like a year and a half ago and I'm a partnered Twitch streamer now. And it's a what 11% or something of my income. And I have a great time doing it. And we're doing it today. And like, why did I listen to those people? <laughs> they don't make anything. They don't do with this type of stuff. They were intimidated by it maybe, but I shouldn't have been. Imagine if I had started years earlier, how much further along I could have been. But can't change the past. 
move forward, start the channel now. If anyone here is watching and you're like, I've been thinking about doing it, let this be the moment that like, just do it, just start it. It doesn't have to be the best channel out there. You just have to start doing it. We get better at it. I also have a few resources here. These are the links I told you about. You can screenshot this if you, I don't have a link for it in the chat, um, but if you are looking to grab Adobe, I have a affiliate link for that. Musicbed and Epidemic Sound are two music platforms I use. Um, and then all my tech stuff is on Amazon in a little list. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, you can just screenshot that and type it on your own. Obviously you can search for these on your own, but if you happen to go through these links, they give me a small commission, which is always appreciated. And I know I'm over, but I would love to continue answering some questions. This is, this is how you find me on stuff too. I'm Sir Wade on everything. Yes, Sir and effects. we're also dropping Sir Wade's links in the chat. So you can go follow him. And we have a ton of questions, Sir Wade. Are you ready to answer some? I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So Raul says, you're a great communicator. Is this a skill or a talent? How do you speak so naturally? A lot of practice. Uh, I, I used to not be, actually, I am a super introvert. Uh, a lot of people don't know that about me. I am super introverted. I used to be so like I used to be so shy that if you asked me to like read popcorn reading in school, I'd be shaking, visibly shaking, voice doing like this. I'd, 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 I'd stand, like I really had a hard time. I get so nervous. It's not something that comes natural to me. Um, it's come from a lot of practice. It's come from just doing different things. In high school, I joined leadership and I had to give speeches and I had to, you know, run rallies and like stuff like that in high school. Then in college, I started clubs and I had to do public speaking, like things like that helped. Um, and when I started the YouTube videos, I was super bad and just making the videos over time, being live, teaching at DreamWorks, like different life experiences help you to find confidence. And I even have a video on self-confidence that like literally that, that exact story and more details about it and how this kind of can be, I have a video on it. But um, it's not something that came naturally, but like, let me be the first example of someone who's not natural at this, but I can fake it. Not that like I'm fake about it, but like I've found my way of doing it. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you too, like having music in the background, like the stream, hopefully you can hear the music, right? Um, it does help, things like that. It distracts me from the fact that I'm standing alone in a room talking to a camera with a microphone in my face with lights on me. Like it's, this would have freaked me out on day one, but now it's just super normal. Like I'm, it's just practice. I can also say I hated popcorn reading in school. That was <laughs> absolutely worse. Why did they make us do that? <laughs> oh, torture. I see a couple of people in the chat are also agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're not alone. Yeah. So next question, Olivia wants to know, what's your opinion of recording videos on a smartphone? I think it's a great idea. It's the cheapest way you can start videos. And most cameras are really solid. That's one of the things where like good lighting will help a lot. Um, I wish I had an example for you, but you know, it's the idea where if you've got lighting in front of you, you are focused. And if you've got a window behind you, it's really hard to see you. You can see everything behind you. It's very blown out. So lighting is important. That's probably the only thing that you really have to consider when doing a smartphone is they don't often work in super dark conditions, but you know, stand as close to the window as you can or something. It's a great idea. You can even edit on your phone too, actually, before I get off the topic. Um, Adobe Premiere Rush is an app that if you have Adobe, I think it's even, I forget. Yeah, well, they have an app and you can edit on your smartphone or on your tablet if you don't have anything else. And there's other free software too, but yeah, I think it's a great idea. Awesome. Emily wants to know, where did you learn to use audio software? Oof, like with such difficulty. Um, audio software, I never really formally learned and I'm not very good at it, mostly tutorials. Um, part of the thing that helps me so much with my audio is actually the thing I bought. It's expensive. It's not something you should buy at the beginning. Wait until it's like needed eventually. But the device I have that does the voices and everything, it actually has these little sliders. So if I want to up or down the music, right? So uh, that helps because I don't have to deal with software. But before that, for a long time, um, it was a lot of tutorials and I'd watch a lot. I really like the tech, like the tutorial tech side of software. So whenever a new company is like, hey, like we have these new technical features. Here's a one hour tutorial of how we're gonna show you how to 
remix the audio and remove noise. I'm like, oh, all right, here we go. Um, I'm a super, I'm like a huge nerd for that kind of stuff. And that helps a lot because I find out about all these cool technologies. I'm like, oh, there's like three buttons I can click and it'll take out that sound from my microphone, um, which is actually a thing you can do. And it's actually very easy, but mostly tutorials. I didn't have anywhere really good to learn. Eilis wants to know, I've noticed you've stayed very real and genuine throughout your channel's growth. What keeps you humbled and how do you stay passionate about the work? Thank you. Um, what keeps me humbled? The, the people, the people I talk to, my wife, my friends, my family. <laughs> um, I don't know, I guess it, I'll be honest with you. It is sometimes really hard not to have an ego for stuff. I was, from my knowledge, I am the first person from the animation industry in any capacity to start making educational content about animation on YouTube. There may have been other videos. I'm not really sure, but I think as far as I know, I'm the first person to really dive into start doing that. And there have been more people starting since then, which is super exciting to see. And I'll be honest, when I first started and more people started popping up, I had that thing of like jealousy of like, oh, this is my space. Like I'm doing this. What do you guys like? Ugh. And it wasn't, it didn't feel good. And um, also I realized very quickly, like there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody making cool stuff. And like some, like there's a, there's a, there's a great creator, um, uh, JD. I, his name is, is said with a French accent and I don't want to butcher it. So JD on YouTube, if you know him, um, makes great stuff. I think he was the next one after me to start making stuff on YouTube. He is fantastic. And he made a video very early on when he started doing his YouTube stuff that it was a video that I had been thinking of doing. He came out with a video, I saw it on my phone and I had it on my list as like one of the videos I wanted to do. And immediately I was like, oh man, like I was gonna do that video. Like he totally stole that idea, but like he didn't actually steal it because he didn't know about the idea, but like, dang it. And I had this like weird thing where I was just like, oh, this feels gross. I don't like this. Like this is a weird mental place to be in. And very quickly I was like, no, this is ego. This is like me thinking I'm so high and mighty like with my YouTube channel, like no. There's room for everybody and it's better that he did it because I hadn't done it yet. Now his video is helping somebody who needs that information and I didn't do it. And I probably wasn't gonna do it for a while. So good thing he made it, good for him, yay. So really taking a step back and putting into perspective like what it is you're doing, like why are you doing it? It's not to make money, it's not to be the biggest, it's not to be the best, it's to help people or to entertain people or to document or whatever it is. Um, Recentering on that thing is what usually I try to come back to to not get a big head because it does happen from time to time and it's never good. It never feels good, doesn't lead to anything useful. Um, it's not something I ever talk about, but it's true. So remembering why you do it. I forgot the back half of that question. I think you covered it. Okay. All right, Angel asks, what are some cool things that we could offer through Patreon that would encourage someone to join? That's a really good question. I have done so many versions of my Patreon and I think I have a few patrons here. Hi. Um, it's a journey. It takes some trial and error. I mean, if you are on top of your stuff enough to have behind the scenes content, early access, that kind of stuff is super fun. It's very common to, to release videos early or to show behind the scenes as you're working on something. I am a patron of a few creators who do that kind of stuff and I love it. I love just seeing the little gifts every now and then like, ooh, that's what he's working on next? Sweet, I can't wait to see the video. It's fun. Um, you do wanna make sure you consider what are you offering your audience? What are you providing for them in value that it's worth them giving you money? That's the thing I, I always try to kind of fight with myself on is like, am I offering the best rewards that I can? Am I making this worth it for people? Because I don't want it to just be some place where people can just, hey, just give me money. Like, no, I want it to be like I'm earning it in some way. Like it is a platform based on like, hey, do you like what I'm making? Do you want to help support me so I can make more of it? Join the Patreon. That is the, the purpose behind the Patreon account. But as a creator, you want to make sure it is worth it to, the, to, the, to your community to, to be a part of that. Um, so if you are an artist and you make cool art, make pins, put it on shirts, put it on a mug. Like you can sell merch. You can give it to your patrons for free as a thank you for supporting you this far. Um, you can... You can give behind the scenes stuff like I mentioned. You can do Q and A's and stuff. If you're not super comfortable on camera and you don't want to do like a YouTube show where you're answering questions and talking about your process, if that's not your content, but maybe your audience wants a little bit of that or you're comfortable kind of sharing it with that small group of people that helps support your stuff, maybe do that. Something more intimate that gives that personal connection. That's something I like to do. Um, 
I also, I even do like animation review workshop type stuff on Patreon. That's the platform I choose to host it through because I get so many people asking, hey, review my work and I just don't have time. But um, the way I feel is that if somebody's going to help kind of make the channel possible, then I want to give back and help them as much as I can. And so I'm constantly trying to rework the rewards on my Patreon to make sure it fits what I do, what they need, and what's available out there already. Because if they're going to pay a bunch of money for something that's already out there, then I shouldn't put it as a reward on Patreon necessarily, unless it's just a fun thing that is easy, you know? Very nice. Tim wants to know, how do you manage your time with work, family, learning, and your other responsibilities? Very poorly. <laughs> I'm terrible at time management <laughs> and balance. Um, it's a tricky one. That's probably one of my worst performance areas as a person. Um, I have family members who have texted me and messaged me and I don't see it for days because I leave my phone in another room and I'm working. I literally don't look at my phone for days and I don't get back to people and people get their feelings hurt. And uh, it's not the best way to be, but I kind of work on it. What I have so far uh, for an answer is time blocking for me is something that helps trying to, I mean, when, when I listen to it, when I do it and actually follow through on it, which is tricky sometimes, but when I actually like set aside, okay, this amount of time is for, I need to wake up at this time, have this much time for this, and then I work, do emails, and then I take a break, I do this, and then I do this, and then I do this, kind of chunking up the day. Some people go super line by line. Some people just kind of say, today I'm doing this. I have to be a little bit more rigid, but not super rigid because if I, if I get off of that plan, it's gone the whole day. I just, I'll be doing other things all day. Um, but for me, time blocking is one of the things. Or at the very least, my wife and I like to set aside days to look forward to. Um, it's something she, she came up with, which I think is really smart. They'll be like, hey, like we should take a day in the next week to do this thing, to sit and watch movies, to clean the house. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> but she's right. It's like, we should do that. Um, and I actually, it's so much fun when we do, we're like, okay, this Saturday, that's all we're doing. We're just going to clean the house. We're going to hang out. We're going to play music. We're going to put on a movie. That's our day. Nothing else is allowed. And knowing that ahead of time really helps. And it gives us a, a something to look forward to. And then when we get there, all work goes aside, everything else goes away. And we have that day and we just have a great time. Even if it's cleaning, it's fun. So that's, these are the two ways I have so far. That sounds nice. Nico wants to know, how did you get your YouTube name? My YouTube name? My, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, the Nico, channel? maybe you can elaborate in the chat and we'll come back to it. Just in case, in case you're wondering, like, Sir Wade, Sir's my, in case you weren't here for the beginning when I said that, Sir's my first name, Wade's my middle name. I put them together, Sir Wade. So it's my real name, if that's what you mean. I'm not sure if that's what you mean or not. All right. Ryan wants to know, are you living fully off the income from your YouTube, Twitch, et cetera, channels? Yes. Uh, my wife and I are both full-time content creators. We both do YouTube. And um, yes, together with our joint income, yes. Um, if it were just up to my, my income, well, yeah. Mm. Three months ago, I would have been like, no way. We lived in LA. We just recently moved to Austin, Texas, which is a lot cheaper. <laughs> uh, in LA, I barely made a dent in the rent. Um, in Texas, I, I think it, I haven't looked. I think it's pretty close actually, but yeah, uh, we, we live off of the content we create. Yes. Where you live matters a lot for this, just for what you can afford. <laughs> Adam wants to know, why don't you dual stream to both YouTube and Twitch? That's a really good question. Um, I, there are some really, really good content creators who share this opinion. Um, there's a lot of reasons. So one part is branding. When, when people say like, oh, like, what do you do? What platform do you live stream on? It's nice to be able to say, oh, I am a Twitch live streamer. That's where you can find me. That's where you go and that's where I'll be. And my community all goes to one place we're all there together, and then we have a good time. If I streamed on multiple places, it's good for like, I mean, it's useful for like, um, like companies, for example. Like if a company wants to reach a whole bunch of people and share information with a lot of people and then do like a webinar or something like this, it's great to be able to put it on multiple places because you may not, you know, maybe you use Facebook a lot, maybe you use YouTube a lot, maybe you use something else. Um, it's nice to be able to kind of broadcast it to where lots of people can benefit from the content 
But as the content creator, you want to be a little bit more specific about where you are cultivating your community. And part of it is like, for example, if, um, if I'm in a YouTube video and I say, Hey, like make sure to hit the thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. I'm not going to put that exact clip on Instagram because YouTube doesn't have a subscribe button. It has a follow button and you double tap to like, it's different, you know? Um, or if I am on Twitch and I'm going to, Hey, like everyone, like, I don't know, uh, drop some emotes. No one's going to know what that means on YouTube necessarily like, emotes, like just like the smiley faces. So there's like a language that kind of comes with like when you are talking on a specific platform and you know where your audience is, you can communicate in a certain way and everyone can be a part of the same thing. Because if I had my viewers on YouTube and Twitch and there's two conversations going on, I am then getting all the questions in my feed, but people can't talk to each other. It becomes segmented and it becomes less of a, a group fun experience. It's more of I'm just trying to get my stuff out everywhere. And it doesn't help you grow. As a content creator, it doesn't help you grow to be on all those platforms. It helps you to have one place to say, hey, everybody, if you want to come to live streams, this is where you can find me and let the different places be specific. Got it. I have an interesting question. Somebody asked, what's the one most value adv valuable advice your wife gave you for doing YouTube? Hmm. She gives me a lot of good advice. She actually comes up with all my good ideas. <laughs> um, let me think for a second. Most value by valuable advice. I think, honestly, I think the most valuable advice that she's given me is probably less about the advice and more of like the message, which is she is very supportive. She really believes in me and that I can do this. And when I struggle and I'm like doubting myself, I'm like, oh, this isn't going well, or the views aren't good, or like I'm like, people aren't watching, people don't seem to be interested. I made this video, I was so excited and nobody clicked on it. And man, like this kind of sucks. Maybe I should do this instead or blah, 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 blah. When doubt starts to creep in, she is there to kind of boost me up and say, hey, you know, she'll be like, yeah, maybe that thumbnail's not that great. <laughs> or um, actually like that is a good idea. Maybe you should do that next time. Um, but more importantly, she's, she helps to kind of remind me like why, she, you know, she kind of tells me like, well, why, why, are you, why are you doing this? Like what's, what's in, she, well, she'll talk to me through it. She'll just kind of help encourage me to like get back on the horse and like, let's keep going. And that's really important. Having some support is very helpful. Not everybody has it. And a lot of people, especially with YouTube, a lot of people don't believe it's a thing that is worth the time or worth doing. And it can be really hard without the support. So for her, to kind of be supportive and her advice is usually like, keep going, keep working on it. Um, it doesn't sound on paper like it'd be all that helpful, but it is that, that constant support is very, very nice to have. Very appreciated if she's watching. I don't know if she's watching it. She might be busy. <laughs> oh, I hope she is. <laughs> How are you feeling for way? Do you want to answer, answer a couple more questions? Yeah, let's do a couple more. And then okay. if anyone has questions that again, didn't get answered, We'll answer them in my live stream on Twitch. Yeah. So Sir Wade will be answering questions in his live stream. Tom will actually drop the link in the chat so you guys can head over there if we didn't answer your question. But we'll we'll pick out a few more and answer a couple more. Sweet. So Jordan wants to know, do time lapses work well on YouTube or would more engagement be required, say voice over here and there throughout the video? Depends on the video, depends on the content. Um, both are good answers. I've watched plenty of videos that are just time lapses with nice music, but I came to the video knowing that that's what it was going to be. Um, like my wood video that went super viral wasn't a great video, but it was mostly a time lapse. It was my working and then I voiced over it. And I don't know if that was good or bad because, you know, the watch time wasn't great, but the views were good. So I don't know. But um, try both, you know, try it both ways and see what you like better. It, it's hard to give a definitive answer, but I've seen both succeed very well. And so the best thing is to just try it for yourself and see what you like. All right. Claire says, I think people put intros that are too long in their videos. A 15 to 30 second intro is too long for me. What are your thoughts? That one's tricky because I, I face that from the other side. Like, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Sometimes I watch my videos. And I'm like, man, this is too long of an intro. I've got like, I, I generally have like 30 second to a minute long intros and I kind of hate it. But the thing is a lot of times, like I, 
you know, you never know who's watching your channel. You never know who's there for the first time, who's been following along. And so it's really hard to just jump right in and just start talking about the thing and believe that those people are going to get interested in, in your channel and stick around and subscribe and come back next time. Um, because if you just start a video and it goes right into it, maybe they're lost. Maybe they're, what are we talking about? What is this? Like, it's hard. The intro kind of serves a purpose to bring people and say, hi, like, welcome to this channel if you're new or if you're not, like, it's, it kind of centers the discussion around like, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing today. The intro has a purpose, but I think you're right. Like long or boring intros that are not well thought out or that are not really purposeful, they can really hurt the video. Um, it's probably the biggest reason why videos drop off right at the beginning is people show up and they're like, <sighs> boring and they leave. But you have to find a, you have to find that balance between, I mean, here's, here's how I find the balance. For me, I've been more, I used to start every video with, Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Sir Wade and whatever I'd say, like, Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Sir Wade and this is how to become an animator on today's episode. We're going to do this thing. Like I had the same thing I'd say every video always. And I realized after a while, like, why am I doing that? I'm just doing it because it's a habit. I'm not doing it because it adds anything. It doesn't actually help anybody. So now what I do is I just start the video and I just start off with, um, I don't know. So you're making YouTube videos and you don't have colored lighting, but maybe, uh, you know, it just, I just start talking about the thing and try to say like, okay, people will click on the video. They'll immediately know what we're talking about. They'll get interested in the topic, hopefully. And then a little bit later, maybe after I've kind of hooked them in theory, I can say, by the way, in case you're new here, I'm Sir Wade and we do a lot of animation on this channel, blah, 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 blah. And I do my intro then. Hopefully by that point, it interests them to either stick around and watch through it or maybe just skip ahead a little bit, but not leave because I've already interested them enough to, to want to stay. So I know what you mean. It's hard though. It's, there's no right way to do it, but there are a lot of channels that don't have any intros and they also do well, but also people don't usually subscribe as soon because they don't get attached to the channel. They just say cool video and they leave. Hard to say. All right. Last question. Leo is asking, how long did it take for your channel to really work? Hmm. A long time. I mean, I started getting cool opportunities a lot sooner than most channels. Um, I was making really unique content and I was doing a pretty good job of it, at least based on the way people received it. And so it did lead to some cool stuff up front within the first maybe year, six months, a year, I'd say nine months to a year. But I'd, I'd say nothing really meaningful happened on the channel to like impact my life outside the channel until, I mean, definitely after the first year, second year, I didn't really start making any money on the channel until, oh, what if we, are we, so if we are in year three right now, I'm, I'm probably about halfway through year three on the channel. I'd say halfway through year two, I started making enough money that I could have bought some, some tech, some gear, some different upgrades. And I did, I invested back into the channel, back into the business, but I didn't really make a whole lot of money in the first year and a half to two years. And I didn't really have a lot of opportunities to pop up that impacted life outside of YouTube either. It was probably in that second year. And that is also a lot sooner than a lot of channels experience. Um, this is now year three and it's definitely the best by far in terms of my content is the best it's ever been and people seem to like it more than they've ever liked it before. And I get cool opportunities every now and then that I get to like host webinars and stuff like this. It's super fun. Um, there's no way to know for everyone. Like I can't tell you like your channel will be two years out, three, like, I, I don't know, but um, you'll never get there if you don't start and just keep going. The more you do, the sooner it'll come. And it might be a lot longer than you'd hope, but it's better than not happening at all, right? So for me, about two years plus. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sir Wade. This was super useful. I'm looking in the chat. A lot of people found it very useful as well. I saw one person even said they were taking notes, so that's great. I feel ready to start my own YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I'm going to share our promotion screen one more time so you could take advantage of those deals. There we go. Thank you so thank much you. again, Sir Wade. This was awesome. So, so much fun. Thank you for having me. And thank everyone for coming. For, thank you for all the questions. 
And uh, if you have more questions, I am, I'm going to be going live in just a couple of minutes on Twitch. I'd be happy to answer more. Yes, please, everyone, click the link in the chat and head on over to Sir Wade's Twitch channel, and he'll be answering the rest of the questions over there. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.